Rogers was a beloved man of the times. He had a special knack for words and a skill for expressing what the public wanted to say but couldn't. His tone and approach left those who were on the receiving end of his blows scratching their heads, while everyday people who were struggling through the Depression era welcomed his insightful wisdom and humor. William Penn Adair Rogers was born on November 4, 1879, in Indian Territory at the home of his part Cherokee family's ranch near Claremore, Oklahoma. Rogers was proud of his Cherokee ancestry and when given a chance related, my ancestors met yours when they landed. In fact, they would have shown better judgment if they had not let yours land. Rogers grew up with a love of the American frontier and studied everything about ranch life, but especially took to cattle roping. While ranching occupied most of his time and interest, his parents at least made sure he had the equivalent of a high school education, sending him to six different schools. Rogers would prove he was naturally bright and chose his lasso over his books. It was rope tricks, after all, that would eventually lead him into show business. At the age of 18, uh, Rogers left Kemper Military School in Boonville, Missouri and re relocated to a ranch in Higgins, Texas. He rode seven days a week, rounding up cattle, roping and branding calves as happy as a teenage boy could be. With a horse and saddle and bedroll of his own, working with seasoned cow hands for just $30 a month. Rogers carried on to New Mexico and California before heading back to his family's ranch. In 1899, Rogers moved to St. Louis where he was involved in a roping and riding exhibition. Rogers said that this was the turning point of his show business career, as it was the organizer of the event that offered Rogers a job touring with his cowboy band throughout the Midwest. In 1902, Rogers left his parents for Argentina where he and a friend planned on living life as gauchos. Rogers wrote family back uh, of his trip. I will write you a long letter on the boat and mail to you when we get to New York, I guess, if I am not too sick. This seems an awful long way, but it is the way they all go from here to that far down in South America. It will take about 25 days from New York to Buenos Aires. However, Argentina was not a welcoming place for English-speaking Americans looking for work. In fact, English-speaking immigrants were in the minority, and Rogers struggled with learning Spanish and Italian, which were the dominant uh, languages. Rogers decided against being a gaucho as he was taken aback by the rough way they handled their cattle and horses. Argentina was also undergoing major social and political changes, which further isolated Rogers. Thankfully, he found his crowd in the English-speaking theaters and around the docks where he felt comfort comfortable talking to American sailors who came ashore. He spent his time telling stories and entertaining the men, and in short time, he was invited on board the ships to perform. By the end of July, and only after three months in Argentina, Rogers secured a livestock job and headed to natal South Africa. He arrived again in a country where there was social upheaval, having just ended the South African War. Rogers saw many parallels in his family history to how British seized the land and colonized the African people. The aftermath of the war was consistent with the events of Indian Territory. The Curtis Act of 1898 subjected citizens of the Cherokee Nation to enroll in private land allotments to prepare for the dissolution of tribal government in the formation of the state of Oklahoma. In 1902, Rogers watched as the South African chiefdoms gave up control to the British occupiers. While in Natal, Rogers came up upon a traveling exhibition called Texas Jack's Wild West Show. Rogers met Texas Jack and dazzled him with rope tricks, jumping in and out of a spinning lariat and performing a routine that worked with the sailors. Texas Jack immediately hired Rogers and billed him as the Cherokee Kid, rope artist and rough rider. Rogers became a favorite of the traveling show, and in 1903, Texas Jack wrote of his appreciation. 
I have the very great pleasure in recommending Mr. W.P. Rogers, the Cherokee Kid, to circus proprietors. He has performed with me during my present South African tour, and I consider him to be the champion trick rough rider and lasso thrower of the world. He is sober, industrious, hardworking, and at all times, and is always to be relied on. I shall be very pleased to give him an engagement at any time, should he wish to return. Rogers soon was hired to a touring circus in Australia and New Zealand before returning to United States, where he performed in the summer of 1904 at the St. Louis World's Fair. Rogers became a star attraction, and with a few months, he was invited to perform on stage in Chicago. This was his first on-stage appearance, and during one of his shows, a dog ran in front of him. He quickly tossed a loop over the horse and hauled him in to much laughter. Rogers proposed to his longtime sweetheart, Betty Blake, in 1906, but she initially refused, doubting a life in show business. After a year, she accepted his second proposal, as long as they could settle down in Oklahoma following his last tour. They married on November 25, 1908, and had three children together. In the following year, Rogers and Betty honeymooned in New York City while he performed his act. She soon realized show business was his calling and supported his endeavors as he found success in the vaudeville circuit. A reviewer from the New York Herald proclaimed, Will P. Rogers, the sensational lariat thrower, is making his first appearance at the Paradise Roof and has proven a sensation in every way. His charming specialty is well out of the ordinary run. Over time, Rogers honed his craft and became comfortable in adding jokes and stories relating more with his audience. One of his favorites was in the use of chewing gum, sticking it in odd places on stage and speaking of its possibilities. Rogers began relying more on speaking in his performances over roping, and in 1913, Rogers was asked to perform in the Midnight Frolic, a late-night show owned by Florence Ziegfeld Jr., a producer of the Ziegfeld Follies. It did not take him long before he was invited to perform with the troupe. At the Follies, he began his famous daily commentaries on the news. All I know is what I read in the papers. This was his unique way to add humor to events and personalities of the day that needed criticism. Congressmen seem to be his favorite fodder. Believe me, I found they are funnier 365 days a year than anything I've ever heard of. Rogers' jokes were soon collected in several books, and by 1922, he was writing similar content for a weekly newspaper column he continued for the rest of his life. This column was carried by hundreds of papers and 35 million fans. His wit earned him the trust of his readers, and he was looked on as a spokesman for the ordinary American. Rogers turned to radio in 1926 and developed a successful weekly broadcast. He also put out a series of books and started appearing as a movie actor in 1918. His first film was that of Rex Beach's novel, Laughing Bill Hyde. Upon success of the movie, Goldwyn Pictures offered Rogers a contract, and by the close of the Follies tour, Rogers and his family relocated to Los Angeles. In a two-year span, Rogers made 12 films for the studio. Rogers continued his film career with Fox Film Corporation, his own production company. In 1927, Rogers was traveling and stopped in Chelsea, Oklahoma to send a telegraph. There he happened upon a young man he was working as the railroad telegrapher, but passing the time was singing and playing the guitar. Instead of asking for his assistance, Rogers quietly listened and encouraged him to sing more. Finally, Rogers told the young man he may have a future on the radio and should consider a singing career in New York. The young man did, and Gene Autry packed his bags for New York, and his story began. By 1934, Rogers' gross earnings were estimated at $600,000 a year, making him the highest paid entertainer of the time. Rogers was an immensely charitable man and gave routinely to charitable and relief organizations. He was also involved with fundraising performances 
to help those affected by natural disasters and those in poverty, including victims of the, of the depression. The worst thing that happens to you may be the best thing for you if you don't let it get the best of you, Rogers once said. Rogers found his Beverly Hills home unsuitable for owning horses, so he moved his family to what is now Pacific Palisades, where the area allowed for playing polo and owning a stable. Rogers built a ranch on the 186 acres, which can be seen today as a state historic park. Rogers acted as the MC of the Oscars in 1934 and found a way to poke fun at the movie business. It's a racket, and if it wasn't, we all would be, wouldn't be up here in dress clothes. Rogers' performances left the audience laughing between awards, and his actions have been credited with changing the event from a pompous ceremony to a joyous riot. In August of 1935, Rogers took a flight with his friend Wiley Post, an Oklahoman pioneer aviator who was seeking a safer route eastward from Alaska. Sadly, the one-engine plane failed and dove into shallow water near Point Barrow, killing them instantly. Following his death, Rogers' wife Betty focused on furthering her husband's legacy and helped establish the Will Rogers State Park and the Will Rogers Memorial in Claremore, Oklahoma. In 1941, she also wrote Will Rogers, His Wife's Story. Thank you for watching. Until next time.